We're just waiting a little bit more. Hello? Okay, people are dropping in. So, um, you know, this is uh, the, the digital new hybrid uh, webinar. We always have to wait a little bit uh, that uh, more people can join us, but they are coming. So please be patient for a minute and then we start with our webinar and the uh, very, uh, interesting topic of understanding the human microbiome. Okay, Markus, uh, do you think we should start? Okay, we wait a little bit. You are muted. Yeah, we should start. <laughs> okay, so very briefly in English, I would like to welcome you all to the third edition of our webinar series on understanding the human microbiome. It's really great to have you here with us today and that you're so interested about the uh, uh, microbiome. We have organized translation from English to German and vice versa. For this session, so I will switch to German in a minute. But first, for those of you who would like to follow the session in English, you can listen to the translation by choosing the English interpretation channel in Zoom. Just check at the bottom of the application. You should see a symbol there for the interpretation. Click on it and choose your preferred language. So, und jetzt noch einmal auf Deutsch. Herzlich I'm going to say the same in German, a very warm welcome to all our listeners, all interested in our third webinar, Understanding the Human Microbiome. This series of webinars is organized together with UEG, United uh, European uh, Society of Gastroenterology. It's quite interesting. And first of all, I would like all our supporters and the support of UEG for us to be able to organize this seminar here represented by Dr. Marcus Peck, which is also my co-moderator who will speak right after me. If we talk about the microbiome, we mean the whole, the entirety of all microorganisms in our intestines or bowel. These organisms and bacteria, bacteria live in a symbiotic uh, condition and help us, us with the digestion as long as everything is in a balance. But if the balance is disrupted, this leads very quickly to health issues and uh, diseases, but for a long time, we didn't pay much attention to the microbiome. Only in the last 10 or 20 years, we really started investigating the microbiome and uh, learned how important it is for our health. We know now it has a much bigger influence on our health, also on our mental health, as we thought previously. It doesn't uh, surprise us. We are not in individuals. We are a, a lot. We have more microorganisms than own cells in our body. Studies show that even uh, the microbiome has an important role to play in the development of tumors. That's why we are going to tackle the following topics. The potential of microbiome in avoiding uh, the uh, progression of tumors, 
and uh, in the initiation and progression of malignant digestive diseases and the role of the microbiome in the treatment of cancer. You can follow these afterwards uh, on a podcast of UEG or our YouTube uh, channel of Sarah Wiener. It was about uh, microbiome and very difficult to process food, which is important for me as a chef. We've got two high-level experts today who are going to discuss the topic with us. It's first Professor Thomas uh, Seuferlein. He's uh, the president of the German Cancer Society. He will give us uh, the view of uh, the clinician and Professor Herbert Tilk of the Medical University of Innsbruck. He will talk about the correlation of gut microbiome and uh, gut cancer. I'm going to give, first of all, the floor to Marcus Beck, who is the president of uh, 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 public affairs of UEG's. Again, UEG is very thankful to you uh, that you're hosting this event. Um, because everybody knows without you, this would be impossible to do. And uh, as you said, it's the third uh, time we're doing this. We had really outstanding uh, speakers and presentations so far, and today will be no exception to this rule. Um, before we start, I will uh, give you a, a, a brief introduction into uh, what UEG is here. Uh, UEG, United European Gastroenterology, is a scientific umbrella organization aiming to improve digestive health. And uh, UEG is uniting 30,000 specialists from every field of digestive health uh, to, to form a very powerful and knowledgeable uh, organization. Now, the microbiome, of course, is interesting for almost every medical discipline these days, uh, and it's one of the major focus topics in research. Obviously, the, the, the gut microbiome is very important for digestive health. Um, and uh, when we look at the groups within UEG that are working on that, uh, we actually have two groups that are uh, very actively involved in research here. The European Helicobacter and Microbiota Study Group, uh, a multidisciplinary group founded by pioneers in the field, originally just working with one bacteria with Helicobacter, but now in recent years having expanded to, to the whole uh, microbiome. They, they do have an official journal, Microbiota in Health and Disease, and they do have an annual conference uh, on, on microbiota therapeutics, uh, writing gu uh, guidelines here, and are also working on, on, on cancer and early detection and prevention. And then, of course, very importantly, is the European Society of Neurogastroenterology and Motility, which is focusing on neural, endocrine, metabolic, immunological, and microbiological regulation of uh, gastrointestinal functions in health and disease. Originally, this was called the functional GI disorders, and, and, and one in 10 Europeans is actually affected by, by problems here, oftentimes at young age. But as we understand more and more about the, the, the gut and the microbiome, we understand that Many of these diseases that formerly were called functional are actually have something to do with the metabolic function also of the microbiome. And therefore, um, projects which they're running like the Gut Microbiota for Health project is about knowledge sharing and debate promoting uh, gut microbiota for these uh, uh, very common disorders. And then we do have... Uh, other specific microbiome-focused digestive health research projects like this legacy uh, uh, project uh, funded by, by the European Union, uh, which is uh, a, a, a European consortium for a personalized medicine approach to gastric cancer. And here you can see the different work packages that are involved here. It aims to improve gastric cancer outcome and to apply personalized medicine uh, to, to its solution. So with that, uh, uh, the only thing that I would also like to highlight here, which does not necessarily have something to do with the microbiome, uh, uh, is the awareness 
Venice Week Opera will have, which is currently ongoing in Brussels, and I would like you to 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 not take note of that uh, because I think this is a very important topic that also has something to do with the gut microbiome. Now, as Sarah has already told you, we 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 had fantastic speakers uh, in the last two webinars, and we have terrific speakers again uh, in this webinar series. And the first one will be uh, uh, Professor Thomas Seiferlein uh, from the University of Ulm uh, uh, to give his his talk uh, on microbiota and cancer. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to hand over to, to Thomas. Thomas, please. Yeah, dear Marcus, thanks very much indeed. And dear Saravina, thanks very much for the opportunity to present this overview on cancer and the gut microbiota. And my really task is to give you a general overview. And later on, my dear friend and colleague, Herbert Tilk is going to give you specific insights on colorectal cancer. The next, please. I don't have any, next, please. Can you give me the next slide, please? Okay, I don't have any conflicts of interest for this presentation. Uh, next one, please. And when we look at our microbiome, we have about 10 to 100 trillion microorganisms in the human body. And they encode more than 3 million genes and produce thousands of metabolites that modulate the human host. And they're adapted, as you see on the right side, very nicely to the interluminal pH. For example, we have a very acidic pH in the stomach and get, it's getting more and more neutral as we go on in the small bowel and the large bowel. There are about 500 to 1,000 unique species per individual. And what do they do, these microorganisms? They produce and break down food molecules into nutrients. So they are quite important for digestion and produce fatty acids, vitamins, and also amino acids. And they're also important for the integrity of the immune system and the gut lining. So the integrity of our gut lining is quite dependent on a good functioning microbiome. And diversity of the microbiota is really key in this context. Next, please. Next one, please. So when we look at the evolution of the gut microbiome, we see that the microbiome is seeded in utero. And it takes a while, up to three to five years of life, until we actually adopt a, a more or less adult-like microbiome in our body. The normal microbiome is a constitutes of two major phyla, the bacteroides and the firmicutes. The, the older we get, the more likely we are to actually get so-called dysbiosis. So old age comes uh, along with many other things, but also with the change in the microbiome. And this might be a link also to why cancer originates predominantly at an advanced age. The next slide, please. Next, please. And our microbiome knows where we live and how we live. And this is quite interesting. This is one example when you migrate from a country like South America to the US, this actually can lead to a lower diversity of the gut microbiota. This reflects changes in the environment, but also changes in lifestyle. And this might be an explanation why the incidence of particular diseases, including obesity and some cancer, increases in populations of U.S. immigrants compared to their country of origin. And studying this phenomenon could provide new clues in the role of microbiomes in actually promoting cancer. The next slide, please. Next one, please. Yes. And one important thing is we can actually, our microbiome is really a self portrait of ourselves. So for example, exercise is linked to an increase in the number of beneficial, good microbial speeches and enriched microbial diversity. So we have better short chain fatty acid synthesis. We have better carbohydrate metabolism and it works already by increasing the frequency of moderate endurance exercise, in this case from never to daily, 150 minutes per week. That's not too much. So if you take the stairs instead of taking the elevator, you might already come up to the 150 minutes per week. So that's worthwhile. The body fat percentage, the muscle mass, the physical activity are significantly correlated with certain bacterial pop populations. And we know that Akamansia, for example, do play a role in that. So our microbiome is not static. It's continuously changing. The next slide, please. The next one, please. Yes. And a lot of can go wrong at the level of the microbiome during life. And this is interesting. A lack of exercise, stress, antibiotics change the microbiome. We already talked about older age. 
decreased gastric motility. Our diet changes substantially the microbiome, even the mode of delivery. So when we have a normal vaginal delivery, the microbiome is totally different from when we have a cesarean section. And this can affect even our microbiome in later life, which is quite interesting. And of course, also genetic effects of the host, of ourselves, do play a role. The next slide, please. So microbial alterations, the so-called dysbiosis, are implicated in many diseases. And you heard from Saravina already that obesity, fatty liver disease, diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease, but also cancer are related to that. And alterations uh, to the microbiome are associated with cancer development, with cancer progression, but also with drug response. And I will give you some examples. The first links, interestingly, between cancer and microbes dates back already 4,000 years. So this is not something we invented in the last 50 years. This is really, the, there will be quite clever people 4,000 years ago that draw on the link. Interestingly, this ranges from the diagnosis to prognosis to treatment as well as remission. Bloodborne microbial DNA, for example, can be used to diagnose certain cancers. The next one, please. Next slide, please. The next, perfect. So there are a few microbes that directly cause cancer. And only 11 microbial species are really oncomicrobes, human carcinogens. But interestingly, they cause an estimated 2.2 million cancers per uh, cancer cases per year, 13% of the global cancer cases. For example, Helicobacter pylori is one of these oncomicrobes. But the majority of these uh, of these bugs complicit in tumor growth. So they act through the host immune system and modulate primary and secondary lymphoid tissues. They also produce metabolites that act on cancer, and they cause antigenetic mimicry with cancer cells. Not only bacteria itself, but also fungi and bacteriophages contribute to gastrointestinal cancers. The next slide, please. So the potential mechanisms of dysbiosis supported tumorigenesis and the tumor growth are, for example, bacterial produced secondary bile acids and chronic inflammation. In the stomach, it's Helicobacter pylori. As you see below, this is the bug. And of course, you know, the Nobel Prize has been awarded um, uh, to BT and Warren for, the, for, the, uh, for discovering that Helicobacter pylori causes uh, uh, gastric ulcers, but also gastric cancer. The next one, please, that you see, this is a breakdown of the mucosal barrier. Can you just move on one slide? Exactly. So we have this muco. No, back one, please. This was an animated slide. Sorry. Exactly. There we are here. The, so the uh, you have a microbiota in the muco uh, muco uh, mucus layer on top of the intestinal epitheliums, and a breakdown of the mucosal barrier causes damage there, and also exposure of the epithelium to toxins with genotoxic properties. Bacteria can grow, uh, can induce oncogenic transcriptional activity and can impair anti-tumor uh, immune functions. And in breast cancer, for example, the microbiota can even affect the levels of hormones and alter the balance in energy metabolism. The next slide, please. So one example in the skin, the effect of the microbiome on cancer can be either directly or indirectly. In the direct effect, we have an interaction of the microbiomes, the residing in tissues where the cancer emerges, such as the skin interacting with melanoma. But interestingly, we also have bacteria in tumors. We have bacteria in colorectal cancer, as you will hear uh, later on, in pancreatic cancer, in liver cancer. There is an intratumoral microbiome. And you have, of course, the direct effects, but you also have indirect effects, but interaction between microbiota and the cancer that resides in a different tissue. And these long-range effects, for example, are caused by metabolites that actually uh, promote a progression of skin cancer or its response to treatment. And diet, interesting, can play a role in this context because it affects the circulating levels of metabolites and the micro microbiota composition in the bowel. The next slide, please. Next one, please. And this is interesting because even metastases have the same bacteria as the primary tumor. And uh, when, you when you have tumor cells that actually metastasize from the primary tumor to a distant organ, they carry bacteria from the primary tumor 
to the distal tissues. So the same bacteria are found in, for example, colorectal cancer in the primary as well as in metastases, and they travel alongside with the metastatic cells. Interestingly, there's this, this is uh, data from mice, antibiotic treatment could reduce the tumor load in this context. And maybe that's some potential for future treatment of patients. The next slide, please. So when we think about, finally, how the microbiota changed treatment, there are several ways of how microbiota affect the treatment. For example, 5-FU is affected by bacterial vitamin B6, B9, and ribonucleotide metabolism. And the microbiota can actually uh, degrade 5-FU in such a way that it's not efficacious. On the other hand, cyclophosphamide efficacy is critically dependent on two bacteria, Banisiella and Enterococcus, Enterococcus hyrae. Without those, cyclophosphamide doesn't work. And even things like uh, immunotherapy, which is now a real rush in cancer treatment nowadays, actually depends on bacteria species that actually colonize the mucosal layer and induce T helper cell immune responses and thereby support and enable the treatment efficacy in the first place. So microbiota play a huge role in the efficacy of even chemotherapy, and they can affect it both ways, either supporting it or antagonizing it. The next one, please. So when you when look at immunomodulation, then mucosal microbes can have a major impact on the immune system, either locally, they can translocate to the sites of growing tumors, or via the mediators like metabolites, cytokines, chemokines, toxins, and even bacterial released vesicles. And the microbes can direct directly with the immune cells or indirectly via immune modulation inflammation. And again, the inflammation caused by the microbiota can be either protumorogenic or can actually inhibit the tumor. And they have a very diverse range of effects of the innate and adaptive immune system. So as a matter of fact, microbes work on anything and everything in the human body. The next one, please. And it does even more. This is an interesting experiment. This is a mouse model where they actually could show that the probiotic lactobacillus acidophilus strain can decrease pain um, relative to controls and can potentiate the effect of opioid analgesics. So your microbiota may even be able to modulate uh, painkillers in patients. And particularly, that's important also for cancer pain. So you see there is a huge range of effects microbiota and uh, bacteria in the, in the uh, bowel can have. The next one, please. So when we look at therapeutic strategies, can we use that to modulate the uh, cancer treatment? It's not yet clearly established. We can target the microbiota selection. We can use probiotics, prebiotics. We can do fecal microbiota transplants or could use antibiotics. That's actually quite used now in clinical trials. Of course, we can target the diet by fibers, by fermented foods, by plants, by polyphenols. Green tea has a lot of polyphenols, um, epigallocatechin gallate, for example, and that uh, has quite uh, good effects in preventing, uh, for example, colorectal cancer. And we can, of course, otherwise modulate the microbiome, as I told you, by exercise. The next one, please. So in conclusion, our gut microbiome is a self-portrait of ourselves. It's highly dynamic in changes in lives and responds to many factors, including diet and exercise. It can become dysbiotic and thereby contribute to tumor development directly and indirectly via metabolites, also to metastases and to treatment resistance. On the other hand, it can be targeted and be used to improve treatment and ideally to prevent cancer. The next one, please. Next one, please. And as with many things in life, it also holds true for the gut microbiome. Diversity is key in this context. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions later on. And hand over to Herbert.
Herbert, you need to unmute yourself. You're still on mute, Herbert, please. Lieber Herbert, Sie sind uh, gemutet. Now it should work. Yes, now you're here. <laughs> so sorry for this short delay. Um, in the second lecture, you will hear now about uh, the gut microbiota in colorectal cancer. I just try to move the slides forward for whatever reason, it doesn't work. Now it works. So um, I will start my lecture with, uh, with, a, with an interesting mouse model we have developed a few years ago. And um, you can see here that uh, certain knockout mice, and we worked with Lipocalin 2, which is uh, an important immune mediator, that they have no gut inflammation. But as soon as you uh, generate mice, which have also a deficiency in IL-10, they develop inflammation. And we have many diseases in humans where inflammation plays a major role in the later development of colorectal cancer. So in those double, so-called double knockout mice, IL-10 plus alipocalin 2, we see a lot of inflammation and many pro-inflammatory cytokines are upregulated. But more importantly, those mice develop tumors. So it's not only an increase in tumor numbers, but also in tumor area. And this means we have a model which uh, has the sequence of uh, nothing, then they develop inflammation and then they develop tumors. Why is this important? Because we have many diseases in humans, especially in the intestine, for example, inflammatory bowel diseases, diseases which affect in Europe 1% of the population, mainly in the third life decade. And one of the major complications, uh, uh, one of the major complication is inflammation associated tumor development in the colon. Well, we know in this model that when we use antibiotics, we can improve uh, inflammation, but we also know in this model, when we uh, improve uh, uh, inflammation with antibiotics, we can reduce tumor load. And we could identify two bacteria, mainly one bacterium, Alistipes finegoldi, uh, 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 and also Robinsonella. This means there are certain bacteria which under certain circumstances are able not only to, in, to uh, drive inflammation, but also to drive cancer. And this highlights the important role of the gut microbiome, potentially also for tumor development. What can we say about CRC and associated bacteria? As you can nicely see in this cartoon, and usually now we speak here uh, about uh, uh, spontaneous colorectal cancer or non-inflammatory associated colorectal cancer. And you can see usually uh, this type of cancer develops from the normal epithelium. We have a hyperproliferative epithelium. Then we have an adenoma. And finally, we have an adenocarcinoma. And as you can see here in the case, in the development from adenoma towards adenocarcinoma, we have a lot of immune cells in the, in the tumor tissue, but we have a lot of various microbes also within the tumor. And I, want, I will speak about three bacteria, which at the moment are most, uh, the most attractive and important bacteria playing a role in this disease. It's first E. coli, namely a very special E. coli, uh, a colibactin producing E. coli. Then in the second case is uh, enterotoxigenic bacteroides fragilis. And in third case, it's Fusobacterium nucleatum. We have a lot of data from uh, epidemiology, but we also know that all those microbes are uh, enriched in the, this cancer, and also some mechanisms uh, have been identified. 
This is the first one of the first reports published in BNS in 2014, where they demonstrated that in colorectal cancer, we see especially in the right colon, a so-called biofilm. Now a biofilm is a very complex biochemical process, but within the biofilm, we can mainly see a, a bacteria. So the, bio, the biofilm is, most, is mostly generated by uh, various bacteria. And they have shown, for example, here in right or in left-sided uh, left, uh, colorectal cancer, that this biofilm contains, for example, mainly bacteroides. So biofilm is a major aspect which has been demonstrated to be of relevance in colorectal cancer. But this has also been demonstrated for other diseases, for example, for a disease which is called FAP. FAP is a genetically driven disorder where almost 100% develop polyps. And in this science paper, they have shown that also in these FAP patients, they could observe the so-called bacterial biofilm. And in this report, they could demonstrate that within this biofilm, you can find mainly again the before mentioned E. coli, which is demonstrated in red, and Bacteroides fragilis, which is uh, which is marked in green. So biofilm is obviously something which is of relevance in colorectal cancer, and uh, this uh, uh, genetic disease FAP is a very excellent example in, into such a direction. And they have demonstrated, for example, when you uh, use those uh, bacteria in, as demonstrated in the middle of this graph, which contain E. coli, special E. coli, when you co-colonize mice with those bacteria, uh, both uh, E. coli plus Bacteroides fragilis, then this causes more tumors with respect to number and also affects mortality in such a murine model of colorectal cancer. We have performed one of the first studies together with Chinese colleagues assessing the gut microbiome along the colorectal adenoma carcinoma sequence. It was one of the first metagenomic studies, meaning we did a deep sequencing within the material we uh, collected. And in this study, we had 55 healthy controls, 42 patients with advanced adenoma, so no cancer yet and 41 patients with colorectal cancer. As you can see in the upper part of the slide that the, the G number in cancer was much higher than that in controls and the colorectal cancer patients are here outlined with, with red. And this is of course a very busy slide, but it tells us on the left side that the healthy controls and here the cancer patients. And as outlined to the, to the, on, on the right part of the slide, we had a couple of bacteria which were convincingly associated with the appearance of a colorectal cancer. And it's, it's interesting because here you can see, for example, again, a bacterium with the name Alistipis put putredininis. And as, I, as you remember in my first slides in our animal model, where we demonstrated the sequence inflammation colorectal cancer, we also demonstrated that a certain Alistipis is important within this disease. We advanced our clinical data with uh, colleagues from China, with a large series of patients, patients from Denmark. We used published cohorts, uh, our one and from France and an additional Chinese cohort, and did again a metagenome wide uh, association study, which was then published in GUT in 2017. And in this study, in this collaborative study, we could, we could identify further interesting bacteria besides Fusobacterium nucleatum, namely uh, two bacteria uh, entitled Pavimonas micra and Solobacterium morei. And as you can see here, we were able to identify biomarkers which allowed us to stage the disease. For example, this was one biomarker, so-called butyryl coenzyme A dehydrogenase from Fusobacterium nucleatum, which correlated with stage of disease, 
or also with a genetic marker from Barbimonus micra. This means we have now a couple of interesting bacteria, bacterial candidates, which might be involved in colorectal carcinogenesis. And we have observed robust or identified robust gene markers associated with colorectal cancer. And uh, all our data went into a large nature medicine paper from 2019, where they used the available cohorts published at that time and could again convincingly shown that there is indeed a very clear microbiome signature in colorectal cancer. And for example, they could link it with an interesting pathway, namely choline degradation. So overabundance of uh, choline trimethylamine lyase uh, gene was associated, highly associated with colorectal cancer. We have already heard in the lecture before that we can find colorectal cancer tissue specific bacteria, not only in the primary lesion in the colon, but also in the, col in the colorectal, uh, in, in the respective liver metastasis. And this has been shown in the science paper published 2018. And uh, they could demonstrate that in all subjects who had Fusobacterium in the colon, in the primary lesion, they also found a Fusobacterium nucleatum in the liver metastasis. Now, this is interesting. Of course, we do not know exactly how those bacteria could move into the liver and are they really relevant or are they only bystanders and do not play a role in the generation of metastasis. But anyway, it is an interesting aspect and an interesting new aspect in, the, in carcinogenesis and respective metastasis, metastasis. Now, the findings I mentioned are summarized here in a cartoon from a review paper we published in cancer cells. So I mentioned Fusobacterium nucleatum. You can see here a structure which is typical for the colon. And you can see also that Fusobacterium is, in, is activating certain pathways which play a role in colorectal carcinogenesis, for example, the beta-catenin signaling pathway. But also other bacteria, as I mentioned, are important, like this BKS-positive A. coli. We also know that Bacteroides fragilis is involved, for example, via activating of reactive oxygen species production. And I mentioned other bacteria like Alistipis, which has been demonstrated not only in animal models as stated, but also in large clinical cohorts. They probably all also contribute to a state of chronic inflammation, which is involved in many states of colorectal carcinogenesis. Dear colleagues, dear ladies and gentlemen, let me summarize. There are models around which nicely have demonstrated the sequence of inflammation and cancer. And obviously bacteria are here involved like Alistipis. It's very clear now that colorectal cancer is associated with profound alterations in gut microbiome. And colorectal carcinoma is probably the best studied cancer at the moment with respect <coughs> to potential roles for the gut microbiota. There are several bacterial strains which have now been identified, potentially supporting CRC development. I mentioned the names and we have identified a new bacterium, Barvimonas micra, in the last years. The gut microbiome affects the efficacy of systemic treatment with immune checkpoint inhibitors. That's another fascinating area in medicine at the moment. And we are currently in the stage of learning a lot of things in this part of medicine and overall, uh, bacteria, intratumoral bacteria is definitely a hot area in cancer research at the moment. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Herbert. Uh, great presentation. Um, and we would like to start the discussion. Sara, would you have a, a question to start with? Yeah, vielen Dank. Yes, thank you. Exciting presentations. I have, have a very simple question. Maybe also interesting for the listeners, which don't want to delve that deeply, uh, not that scientifically, as Professor Tilk did. So, first of all, they want to know 
what can every individual do for his gut microbiome in order to prevent cancer and tumors? What would you recommend? I tried I to do it English. I tried to uh, to explain that in my talk. I think exercise is quite important, and is you don't have to do much. It's only 150 minutes per week that already has a substantial change on your microbiota, and of course, the, what what you eat is what you are. So, the the right kind of food, uh, uh, fiber, also uh, bear, uh, bearing in mind that. Uh, polyphenols are good for your microbiota and actually it helps you to select the right ones as compared to the wrong ones which means for example uh, containing green tea extract and stuff like that so all these things you can do to really uh, improve uh, your microbiome and to really do something about it so eating the right things and doing exercise regularly and when i talk about exercise i mean endurance exercise and not just pushing weights because that's a, that's nice if you want to do that for fitness and for muscle uh, building but not uh, exactly for your microbiota for that you have to do something on endurance so uh, when i might add to that i also have to say that uh, the most important uh, aspect is lifestyle and lifestyle is a very complex process of course but it involves definitely the way we are eating and uh, I would say in a, in a, on a rather general um, way, we, we recommend Mediterranean lifestyle. So not too much red meat. And uh, there are so many studies, especially with colorectal cancer and uh, food associations where it has been shown that uh, uh, red meat is, uh, is a disadvantage. So uh, modulating your diet is very, very important. Then also uh, looking at your weight, at your weight balance is very important and exercise is very important. And probably it's a, it's a summary of all those aspects, which is so relevant for our health. And it also brings back the responsibility to each person, the way you are living, the way you contribute to your, to your health and also to your GI health. And we know, for example, from the uh, gut microbiome, it's modulated over the whole life. So it's a very dynamic world inside. And it's, it's, it's dynamic until the end of life. So we can always contribute over the whole life. And there is an interesting question I've read here, which fits probably into this discussion. Uh, there's, uh, it has been it's stated here, our generation has been extensively cured when we, are, when we were young by antibiotics. At the same time, we are getting older and more prone to developing colorectal cancer. And at the same time, we are the most targeted population to get the COVID vaccine. Really three factors trigger a, 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 higher, a, a higher rate of colorectal cancer. And I would say, yes, f food is very important. The use of antibiotics in early life, we do not know exactly whether it might have a disadvantage uh, for certain diseases. We know it has a disadvantage, for example, for the development of inflammatory bowel diseases, so a disadvantage for developing inflammation. And for the COVID vaccine, uh, my personal opinion is it will play no role, no effect on, uh, on more colorectal cancer. It's just, uh, if I may add to that, I think one problem with the whole pandemic and is in COVID is that people tend to postpone preventive measures. So they don't go to colonoscopy because they yeah. say it's so busy anyway, I'll wait till everything is over. And now we see it's not over in a short uh, uh, on the short term. So my plea would be to everyone, don't postpone any preventive measures. Go to your doctor, don't, uh, go, go to colonoscopy, do your uh, fit test for preventing colorectal cancer, that's much more important than uh, together with all the other means, food and exercise, than being scared about having potential effects of the vaccine. And I'm absolutely with her, but I don't think the vaccine has, will not have any role in mm -hmm. colorectal cancer carcinogenesis. And I'm not so sure about stress either, because we don't know what type of stress triggers cancer. And uh, there might be also some some stress which is good for you. So we don't know really about that, but we know about other things that are really important and prevention is one of them. 
So Thomas, uh, may I may I ask here uh, along those lines? You know, we had uh, in, in 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 one of the of the last webinars, we had Aaron Siegel here who showed us the very individualized approach with regards to diabetes uh, interventions and microbiota. So, so the question here on carcinogenesis would be. You know, you're giving rather general rules, but is it really one fits all or is it more individualized things that one diet might be preventive for one person while it might harm another person? Uh, maybe we're not there yet, but do you have any, any ideas uh, of how to tackle this? Well, generally speaking, we know there are healthy diets, and that's what Herbert already mentioned, Mediterranean diets. Also, when people change, when they go from, for example, Japan and China, go to the U.S. and change their diets and go to a Western-style diet, we see that there is a huge increase in colorectal cancer. So I think there is actually a quite general thing, what is good for you, and, um, and uh, a lot of vegetables, fruit, fiber is good, red meat uh, a lot of red meat, a lot of alcohol, and a lot of fat is not good for you. So I think this one can generalize. It, it might be that certain tumors are specifically prone to certain effects of particular components like polyphenols or something like that. But it's very, very tricky, as you know, um, to a a assign specific functions to a specific nutrient because our, nu our nutrition is so various we we eat so many things and over and it's a whole it's over the whole, uh, whole lifespan that it's very hard to really attribute certain food to certain effects and i think this is what sometimes industry wants to tell us that you have to eat this and that or you have to buy this and that then everything is fine and that's unfortunately not the case and this also applies to nutritional supplements and stuff like that a good mixture. Diversity in nutrients is also quite important as compared to diversity in microbiota. And in diabetes, obviously, it's easier because you can measure the blood uh, sugar the same day, you know, and, and he could show that with 2000 different diet modulations, you can actually have a great impact. Uh, we understand that in, in cancer, this is a different story. Sarah, you wanted to ask something or Herbert, you... Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted wanted to to state also. Yes, my you professor Tilken than me. Yeah, do, do me, you mentioned the, the discussions First professor you had me. diabetes and all those diseases. I mean, but it's also true for colorectal cancer. It's a, in a way, it's also it's of course it has something to do also with age, but it has a lot to do with lifestyle and nutrition. So it's a, also a nutrition related disease. And for example. Uh, the, the, the fact that we are now seeing uh, colorectal cancer below 50 in the whole world, that's an, that's an issue which is definitely associated with environmental factors and we believe it's associated with diet and it brings again now in the political dimension and dear Sarah, it's very important because it's the lifestyle we, we all live and have, but it has big disadvantages. It, it, it leads to diseases and colorectal cancer is just one disease because too much food, too much dense food, too much ultra processed food, too much meat. It's, it's so important. So it's a, in a way, it's a, it, it has, of course, a big public health dimension and cannot be dealt by physicians or by us. And therefore, it, it, it has a very important public health aspect within it. All right, Sarah, please. Ja, äh, es hören ja nun auch einige politische Entscheidungsträger. We have a few political decision makers here, such as me, and I would like to know what the challenges are and what would you like to see from politicians, uh, maybe in terms of framework conditions. And I'm also interested in knowing what the special challenges are, but also the opportunities or the hopes in terms of microbiome research. Do you want to start and then I follow? Maybe you can start and I bring microbiome changes then. Okay. So um, I, the problem is science can raise awareness and society has to actually establish it. And this is what we see with the COVID vaccination. This is what we see with, uh, of course, the microbiota as well. And I think uh, raising awareness on health and nutrition, also getting the prerequisites right for advertising, um, 
this, uh, the, uh, for example, this, uh, the, the traffic lights on sugar content and fat content in nutrients, I think is very important to really know that everyone can immediately see what type of nutrient am I eating? It's not that you forbid people to do something, but you raise awareness and you see this is a red light sugar prone nutrient. So don't really eat too much of it. You must not eat it at all. No, that's not the point. It's not for beating it, but it's just raising awareness. And a lot of people, if they would be more aware of what they eat, I think they would be treating themselves much better. And we have to start very early on. We have to start with the kids. We, we Starting with older age people, it's nice, but it's we have to start in the schools. We have to start with school food as well, which is horrible at times, at least at some places in Germany. And um, so we have to really start educating our youngest to really not become an obese uh, adult population. And this is, I think, part of the reason what Herbert already mentioned, why we're seeing this increase in younger aged uh, people with colorectal cancer, because this is the way we treat ourselves. We treat ourselves not well enough. And I think politics has to support that, has to raise awareness and has to really educate. This is would be my plea. And research in microbiota, and this has already been mentioned by Marcus, the project where we also compare microbiota, I think we can do an awful lot. We have to also set the limitations right. This is not a novel wonder world. This is just another way of understanding how cancer originates and how cancer treatment is modulated and progression is modulated. This is not going to sort out cancer once and for all. This is one part of the puzzle contributing to the whole picture of how a tumor is actually growing and how a tumor is developing and propagating. So it's very important. It's also important to support research that these projects, as mentioned by Marcus, are for me quite important. And it's important to put that on a broader level to really compare country-wise also, not only in one particular area, but to really see what is the relevance and what is the broader level. And of course, the next level is omics because a lot of bacteria work via their metabolites and to really see what are these metabolites and how can they be manipulated. I think this is the next challenge and it's already taken, of course, by many groups. So there is a lot of potential. It's not going to solve the problem, but it will get us one step ahead again. When I might continue, it's, uh, I totally agree, it's public awareness. And it's very similar as with diabetes or obesity. And please keep in mind, colorectal cancer is highly associated with diabetes and obesity. So those patients, those affected individuals have a higher rate of colorectal cancer. So we will, we will need very similar pre preventive strategies Medicine cannot achieve that. We need public health awareness. We need, we need big com campaigns. Uh, Thomas just mentioned traffic lights. And I think we need a lot, a lot of actions into such directions. And maybe nicot nicotine uh, consume has been an easy thing, uh, question mark. Food is much more challenging, I believe, but we need probably similar approaches so that people everywhere will understand what is maybe more or less healthy for me. And that's already a very complex question for most of patients, but it's the only chance when they go into these directions. And of course, microbiome research will be very important because we hopefully can identify, let's say, the 10, 20 or 30 bacteria which play a key role, which contribute to colorectal carcinogenesis, and which can be manipulated in the future. I'm convinced this will be possible, but this is still a long way to go, but that's the ultimate goal of microbiome research uh, with respect to this disease, to really understand what are the better peons, what are the key microbes driving this disease. Yes, and, and of course, uh, the, the obvious things, and I mean, this is why I uh, highlighted the AWARE week uh, currently ongoing, is of course, alcohol is one of the nutritions yeah. that we need yeah. to control, you know, Absolutely. and control much better. Uh, you didn't mention it specifically, but of course, there's good data showing the negative impact of alcohol on, on the microbiota and, and through that, that uh, on cancer development. I mean, uh, with respect to this, we have uh, nicely shown that, for example, alcohol eliminates one bacterium, which has the name Acamansia, and this is one of the most beneficial bacteria inside our body. So this bacterium is killed by alcohol. So it's a, it's a, nice, a nice example 
how alcohol has bad effects on, 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 on our health in general. So, Sara, this would be a very important message for the politicians because you, you realize that in Europe we're really struggling to, to, to control alcohol. We don't even get alcohol labeling to a reasonable uh, legislation. So, so it's a really an uphill battle. Uh, and and, and micro, microbiome research is just one part uh, of the whole thing. But I think uh, controlling advertising uh, and getting the message out is really very important uh, from a political point of view. Yeah, jetzt wollte ich gerne noch etwas dazu sagen, uh, ganz kurz. Uh, weil yes, I just wanted to add something because we are at the end here. What I've learned in the past microbiome webinars, but also from other physicians and researchers, is that, of course, nutrition is important. I have a foundation which is starting to educate children in elementary schools, for example. I think the first measure would be to give people back their sovereignty over their body and to, to make sure that uh, they also eat natural food. We, we've heard that ultra processed food also reduces the microbiome. We've learned that there are individual changes, of course, from one human to the other. So we are born with a certain microbiome and that's different from that of others. We have learned that cancers and tumors can also be influenced through our lifestyle, through activity, by avoiding nicotine and also avoiding alcohol, of course, and by choosing a fresher and more natural nutrition. And I re-emphasize that because there is a food industry trying to tell us that we can just consume certain products and then just avoid um, ha having these bad effects on our health. But this is not true. We need to use natural food. This is to a topic of my political life. I want labeling and also I want to prohibit advertising for children because food specifically targeted for children often contains even more sugar. I advise you not to eat anything which your grandmother didn't eat. Eat a lot of diverse food, a lot of fresh food and individual food, and also eat seasonal food. And if you can, eat organic food as well. That was my last word. And I would like to hand over to Marcus, but before then, I would like to thank our high quality speakers. You will be able to listen to this webinar later as well. And I would like to thank them for their time and for their inspiration, which they have given me. Thank you so much. Thank you, of course, for being the host again, uh, and the two fantastic speakers and the topics, and of course, we could talk much longer, uh, but I think uh, this was uh, the third webinar that we did. It, it will be my last one since I'm stepping down, but I know the initiative will continue uh, also with, with, a, uh, <laughs> with the next chair of the Public Affairs Committee. So, so thank you very much to all of you. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the future webinars. I'm sure they will be very interesting and very informative. And uh, as we, uh, the, the last question that we got here in the, in the chat is, is how can we improve awareness and would the European code against cancer need to be updated? Well, I, I'm not sure that that code against cancer needs to be updated because essentially everything's there, uh, but we need to talk more and there needs to be a, a, a lot more emphasis um, on, 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 on nutrition. We need to ban the advertising of harmful diets. Uh, uh, you know, sounds like a simple step. It's very difficult on, on the political field. But this is, I think, for, for, uh, uh, for next year. And for right now, uh, I'd like to thank you all very much. Uh, and goodbye. <laughs> Have a good time. Thank you for inviting.
拜拜。